Rapid Media Presents. Rapid Media TV. Hi, welcome to Kayak Angler Magazine, and I'm Rick Burnley, editor. And uh, we're lucky to have some of the uh, best uh, kayak fishermen in the industry here with us today to answer some reader questions. Uh, start out here, we got Jeff Little. He's the uh, pro angler from Wilderness Systems and a, uh, uh, makes uh, confluence baits, right? And also the host, confidence baits, I'm sorry, and uh, host of um, kayak, uh, uh, Blue Ridge Kayak Fishing, right? We have uh, Captain Phil Spencer. He's a uh, guide from Corpus Christi, Texas and a pro for uh, Johnson Outdoors. We have Drew Gregory, uh, fishing guru at Jackson uh, Kayaks, and uh, Jim Sammons, uh, host of the uh, Kayak Fishing Show. So um, I guess we'll start with some reader questions that we uh, got on Facebook. Um, <clears throat> starting with, uh, starting with uh, Phil, uh, one of our readers, uh, John Baker, had a question. He, uh, he wanted to know, uh, you know, Johnson's got so many boats out now. What boat are you using now to fish the uh, Texas uh, Gulf Coast? I still uh, actually prefer a Prowler 13, the old school boat. Uh, it's just a lightweight boat, easy, maneuverable. The way it tracks is just incredible. But I could fish out of any one of them. But that's the one that I prefer myself right now. But that may change with this new Predator. Yeah. You know, being able to stand up and sit on this boat all day the stability and, and it actually the 13 actually paddles really well really well but yeah i'm still on a got a bunch of the old school proud of 13s that's cool um <clears throat> jeff next question is coming to you uh we know you make a lot of your own baits and a lot of your own lures uh we've seen pictures of your garage and uh, your workshop um uh sean mccurley one of our readers asked this question uh he asked if you've uh, worked with tungsten you know that seems like the big uh the big the big movement in uh, you know leads and stuff like that. Have you worked with that yet? I, I do a lot with um, different do it molds. Uh, I do their soft bait stuff. I do a lot with the you know pouring lead. Um, I actually looked into it a couple years back, and tungsten has such a high melting point. It's not a material you could really work with in terms of you know a, a do it yourself type thing. Um, tin, however, is something that you can use. It's something that's less dense than lead, and it's something that. If you if you want a bait that you can work a little bit higher in the water column than you would with with lead, you mm. could go the tin route, and uh, you can use the same you know the same stuff that you use the same, same lead pots, same molds and everything. So mm. tin's another another good option. And why are people getting away from lead? Um, I don't know that people are getting away from lead. There's a lot of I think uh, push from the environmental lobby to you know to restrict it and, and really kind of backdoor their agenda on the on the fishing industry which uh, we do need to you know to unite and, and keep it so that we can continue to use right. the lures that we've always used that's cool um, drew next question is coming to you this question is from Kevin will one of our readers he wants to know what the uh, what the best fish finder is to mount in a Jackson kayak you know what are some qualities that you look for in a fish finder? Uh, that you're going to use, you know, on, on one of your kayaks. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, Kevin, great question, man. Um, you know, I prefer the uh, Raymarine Dragonfly, and actually, you know, with Jackson Kayak, we've just kind of partnered with them. A super solid unit. And one thing I like, obviously, is going to be uh, the new, like, you have d down scan and structure scan. That's kind of important to me. I want to see that structure. I want to see what it is. We have that technology now to do that kind of stuff. So why not do it? Why go old school where you just have, you know, a little picture of a fish or just, you know, some. You know, not so clear imaging, like the Raymarine, just their technology and the chirp. And even Jim can really speak to it even better than I can because he's used fish finders even way more than I do because uh, I kind of grew up more of just a river fishing guy and used some back when I used to fish out of a bass boat. But uh, anyway, uh, I'll let Jim speak to it a little bit as well. But that's the one I prefer is the Raymarine Dragonfly. Really solid unit, and I've been loving, loving it so far. And it actually can uh, go, how deep is it, Jim? Like it goes down to like over 600 feet. So. You know, anywhere you want to take it, it's going to give you a clear image all the way down to that level. So, anything else you want to add to that one? Or, uh, well, I think one of the most impressive things about that particular unit, for me anyway, is the screen to unit size. Okay. Uh, the whole thing is screen. Right. You know, there's not a whole side panel that is controls. So you have a unit that is, you know, seven inches across. It's seven inches of screen. So you don't have a lot of 
extra space on there that is just taking up space when you're trying to store it and all that. That's really one of my favorite things besides the just insane signal and clarity of picture you're getting on it. Right, right. And you say these have the chirp technology? Exactly, they do. What is that it, exactly? Uh, I mean, basically, the way I've actually uh, been told, it basically acts like, so imagine like a, a spotlight, say like a flashlight, you know, there's like a certain beam, but on a mag light, you can adjust that beam. Right. This kind of the chirp is a clear, and it kind of helps, kind of give you a better, just just a more peripheral vision of everything, rather than just a, like a small degree. It actually is a clear, crisper imaging. Yeah, so I know that kind going, of instead of going out at so many, instead of going out at just 200 hertz or whatever right. it is, it's going in and out, in and out, in and out. Okay. So it gives you better contrast, better definition, and a little bit wider. Um, uh, definition. So you can have both the regular fish finder on and the chirp, so you have split screen. So one is giving you your really good fish readings, right. and the other one's giving you the really, really good structure. The bottom readings, yeah, cool. And it's on one transducer. Wow, and that all fits right into the. Uh, the uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the new big rig well. on Jackson is going to be made so the transducer is actually fitting up there, and just coincidentally, it fits really perfect in the channels in the bottom of the uh, the CUDA, mm -hmm. so you can uh, scupper mount that as well. Cool. Jim, keep the microphone. The next question is coming to you. It's from uh, Victor Jesse Valencia, and he's just getting into uh, white sea bass fishing, yellowtail fishing, and he wants to know a good uh, introductory rod and reel combo that he could kind of kill both of those birds with one stone. Well, with white sea bass, you know, we're getting some really big white sea bass um, in California right now, so. You want a, uh, a rod that's got good pulling power, a fairly soft tip, because these fish have a pretty soft mouth. Um, the, the thing about white sea bass, though, is they're not, they're not a yellowtail, they're not a tuna. These things aren't gonna put you to your knees. You know, they're not a super strong fish. So, um, a small lever drag reel, uh, like the, uh, the Akuma Andros, Akuma, what was it called? I can't remember now. Uh, but a small lever drag reel or like a uh, Shimano Trinidad 12 or 14, those are really my favorites. Loaded up with uh, fluorocarbon, or I'm sorry, loaded up with braid and then a short top shot of fluorocarbon. I said, you don't need anything big for white sea bass. I mean, I landed a 62 pounder last year and it took me about a minute. <laughs> so they're, they're not the strongest fish in the world, but you may run into yellowtail too, so you want to have that appropriate gear. The main thing I always tell people is, is you don't need big gear in a kayak, just make sure you have good gear. Right. Because you may be on a fish, if you get into those bigger fish, you may be on for a really long time. Plus something that's going to take the, uh, the rigors of kayak fishing a little bit better, you know. Yeah, kayak fishing is harder, as all, everybody who <laughs> saltwater fish, kayak fishes knows, kayak fishing is harder on your gear than any other kind of fishing. So we may have zero maintenance on our kayaks, but we've got a lot of maintenance on our gear. So uh, you need to take care of it, and having better gear is just going to last longer. Cool. Next question is coming to Phil. Phil, we had a lot of questions about tournament fishing. You've been doing that for a long time. Uh, people wanted to know, you know, what's a good way to get into tournament fishing, and you know, how how did you get into it to begin with, and then, you know, what would you give recommendations to people that are just interested in getting into uh, starting tournament fishing? If you're going to get into it, start fishing the smaller tournaments, the mom and pop tournaments. Um, you know, it's not about winning a tournament; it's about being consistent. Meet the people, get to know a bunch of different people. Um, the camaraderie that you get there, there is, it's not like a boat tournament. Uh, most kayakers are willing to sit and talk with you. Um, I get along with every single one of the guys from all the different companies. Uh, when I go to Louisiana and I go to Florida, uh, it's just about being helpful and, and hanging out. You can get into it anywhere. I mean, start small. It's going to take time. Uh, to try to get in for sponsorship, that takes a lot. Uh, you may have to spend a lot of your own money to do that. Um, we're not going to get rich winning tournaments. This isn't the Bass Pro Circuit. Uh, but I would just say start small, um, go out. I, I love the IFA because this is their fourth year. They go state, to, you know, different states. Um, it's gotten a little smaller, but I like supporting those tournaments that, that, are, that go all the way around the country. You've got some big tournaments like the Jackson Tournament. You've got the Jamaican Bay Tournament. You've got some in California. Those tournaments, and, and Jim will tell you, these guys will tell you, that when you get there, yeah, there's people there that, that they're out to just win, but there's people there that are out to have a good time, meet new friends, and wherever, whatever happens, happens. If they win, they win. If they don't, they don't. They don't really worry too much about it. 
the way I look at it is, is, is I try to be consistent, and if you beat me at a tournament and it makes you feel like you've accomplished something and raises your fishing level, then I'm a winner too. Mm -hmm. That's the way I see it. And be helpful. I, I've taken a lot of charters with people that fish against me now in tournaments. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I love that. It, it brings out the best in me. I'm done early. I don't right. sit and pound the water all day. I, I've learned way back when what fish do, and I literally drink, I taste the water everywhere I go. And I can I can taste the salinity level. So I, it's 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 hard to explain to people, but I, I see things in a different li different way than most. Mm -hmm. I don't go out and pound the water to try to win a tournament. That's not what I'm there to do. I'm there to have a good time, meet new friends, and whatever happens, happens. You know? cool. Thank you. More about Rapid Media's print and digital magazines, International Paddling Film Festival, on-water events, and online store. Visit rapidmedia.com.